It turns out the prescription for wellness in our lives is actually many things we have a lot of control over. We're gonna learn what those are right now from Dr. Dave Larson. Welcome to Happiness Adventure. I'm Lisa and together we'll explore ways to cultivate real joy in our lives. Welcome to Happiness Adventure, Dave. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here. You say that lifestyle is the best medicine and can you explain what you mean by that? Our bodies and our brains are information gathering and processing machines. Yeah. And, you know, every single day, what we do and where we place our attention has an impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our brain, whatever we focus on grows stronger. The brain will allocate resources from one neural pathway to a different one based on where we place our attention. So those small decisions of, you know, Gosh, what time do I wake up? How do I wake up? What do I eat? What's my morning routine? How do I get to work? Um, do I listen to something in the car when I'm on there? There's so many opportunities to make little tweaks. Some things lead to emotional well-being, but that actually can reduce stress, which has a huge impact on physical well-being. Yeah. We're not one thing at a time, right? Our emotions yeah. and our bodies. and It's all connected all of it all the time. Yeah. So how do you see a focus on well-being and lifestyle medicine being different than what's going on in our culture right now? Yeah, I think it's very different. I have Kaiser, for example. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, Kaiser talks about thrive. And yet, if I don't do anything, nothing happens. My doctor never calls me... Um, no one from the team reaches out. And the expectation is I kind of take care of my own well-being. Mm -hmm. And if I get sick, I'll you know, go through the hoops to reach out to them. Yeah. I think healthcare needs more of a paradigm shift mm -hmm. of a focus on disease and understanding disease to a focus on well-being. Mm -hmm. And rather than just leaving people alone to take care of their well-being, say, let's study that. Let's put some time and attention into understanding how good can you feel? Yeah. How good can your body operate? You know, we learn in medical school the first two years about physiology, you know, like how the kidneys work, how the heart works. And then the rest of the time in medical training is all about pathology, disease uh -huh. states. Yeah. So, you know, when you get into studies of peak performance or astronauts, there's a little bit of studying um, how well can we function. Yeah. Um, but that's what I'm really about and what I think lifestyle medicine is about. Using those small tweaks and daily habits to actually promote well-being. Yeah. Sure, we'll handle disease if it comes up. Mm -hmm. Some diseases we can reverse, but the focus is on well-being. It seems like in psychiatry, which you're also board certified in, the emphasis is really on diagnosing negative mental states and not on even naming positive ones. Yeah, well said. There's a whole you know, book that comes out every few years, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh -huh. And it's about diagnosing states of mental illness. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the advantages would be if we shift to focusing on how well we can be as opposed to troubleshooting illness or diseases? Yeah. Like I said before, what we focus on gets stronger. Mm -hmm. So we'll see more a lot more education and evidence-based education for people. Of how do I take care of myself? Yeah. Um, how do I create quality relationships? If I want to live a long time, you yeah. know, the best data for long-term well-being is through relationships. Yeah. So, you know, having that in schools and in classes, and um, a relationship well-being checkup at the doctor. Yeah. Right, and having a whole team that's kind of there to coach. So I see a lot less chronic disease, a lot less medication and surgery, billions of dollars saved mm -hmm. um, from both you know, the government, taxpayers, and health insurers. Yeah. You say there are several domains over which we can influence our wellness. Could you talk about what some of those are? Start with kind of the basics. Nutrition, uh -huh. it's not just food. I think conceptualizing nutrients as chemicals entering your bloodstream. So nutrition is about kind of looking individually is how does someone's genetic makeup, their disease states and their lifestyle interact to make 
up their nutrient needs mm -hmm. and how can we get that primarily through food and then if we need to supplement how do we find safe healthy supplements yeah so that's a big domain yeah. probably the foundation then the other ones are exercise and movement stress resilience building quality relationships like we talked about and kind of sleep optimization is there anything else that you as a physician see that we should really be focusing our attention on for better wellness that we have full control over? Yeah, a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking another thing. We haven't talked really about stress resilience. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Think of resilience like a rubber band, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being able to stretch and still maintain functioning. I think um, a lot of people have this concept that stress is bad. Uh -huh. Right, it's, you know, stress management, and that's not the case at all. Um, stress is essential to life, mm -hmm. and you know, if you study human flourishing and people who are kind of performing at the best, they always have a history of stress. But it's you know, it's called eustress rather than distress. Uh -huh. That's stress for a good reason. You know, the type of stress yeah. you set, you have a goal, and you're stressing to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. You know, the stress of training. The way I see stress resilience training is making sure people are being stressed for the right reasons. And then also over 95% of people have no idea how to relax. Yeah. Um, and in our culture where it's saying like, do more and more and more and more, mm -hmm. it makes sense, you know, and it's not part of you know, your everyday class. Like no one gets a curriculum in how to relax. So how, how do we relax? One hack that I like to teach patients is controlling the rate of their breath. Mm. So basically, when are you the most relaxed? When you're in that deep sleep. Yeah. And how fast are you breathing when you're in that deep sleep? It's about 14 seconds per breath. Wow. So like four breaths a minute. I didn't think it was possible to breathe that slowly. Yeah. And so sure enough, you start breathing that slowly when you're awake, you activate what's called your parasympathetic nervous system, which uh -huh. is your unconscious rest and digest nervous system. Uh -huh. So I tell people just close their eyes, Breathe in to a count of seven or longer, uh -huh. and then breathe out to a count of seven or longer. Okay. That's 14 seconds. Yeah. Do it for at least, in studies, it's done two minutes, three times a day. Uh -huh. And after six weeks, we see all sorts of changes. Depression, anxiety, um, fMRI, changes in the brain. So, you know, that's one hack, breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, another obviously huge one is mindfulness meditation. Yeah. And... That's basically deliberate practice, um, like drills of creating a space between stimulus and response. Okay. So instead of having a knee jerk reaction, of like my knee itches and I scratch it, it's creating the ability in my brain to say, oh, I'm aware that my knee is itching and that I want to scratch it. And I can choose in that moment, do I want to scratch it or not? Yeah. And you can imagine if you get really good at that skill of creating space, mm -hmm. you kind of become like a ninja in life. Um, you know, you can just sit in a place of calm and really make intentional decisions rather yeah. than like running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Yeah. So meditation, especially in my anxious patients, they need to be warned that um, you feel a lot worse when you start to meditate for about six weeks. It's going to be really unpleasant and really uncomfortable and it's worth it. So do it anyway. What is that discomfort that an anxious person experiences in the process? So a lot of time people feeling, feeling anxiety will try to get away from it uh -huh. either by being busy, by going for a run, by drinking, by getting lost in a conversation because yeah. um, they're trying to get away from being with themselves. Uh -huh. So in meditation, you stop all that. You can't do any of that. No more crutch. And so they have to sit with whatever's alive in them. Uh -huh. And so if it's anxiety, it's really uncomfortable just to sit with that. Yeah. So it takes about six weeks and then it gets better? Yeah. So about six weeks is around when you start to actually experience pleasure from the act of meditating. Uh -huh. And you start to get all the other evidence-based benefits. Uh -huh. um, so stress-related illnesses... We see a reduction, um, you know, longevity, learning and memory, dementia. The way the brain learns is more through spaced repetitions rather than duration. So okay. 
I would much prefer someone to meditate twice a day for two minutes uh -huh. than three times a week for an hour. Okay. So in general, um, 20 minutes is around the goal of what people shoot for. But when you're getting started, I usually tell people like five to eight minutes. Okay. Because I want them to be successful in getting a daily session in for six weeks. Yeah. If someone is feeling depressed, which of these lifestyle domains that you've mentioned is a good place to start in kind of pulling themselves out of that? Yeah. So, um, you know, the best treatment for depression with evidence is called cognitive behavioral therapy, uh -huh. CBT. And in cognitive behavioral therapy, where we usually start is called behavioral activation. So we don't pay attention to what people are thinking. We don't really pay attention to what they're feeling. We pay attention to what they're physically doing. Even if you're feeling horrible and depressed, yeah. when you start doing the activities or the behaviors that you used to do and you're feeling like you were thriving, uh -huh. it's really difficult to feel depressed. Yeah. You know, so I had a few patients who used to love to golf. And so part of his treatment plan was to golf yeah. while depressed. Mm -hmm. So if, if depression kind of came mostly in you know a certain room in the house or in your office changing your environment mm -hmm. and your physical state can help you access different thought patterns yeah and there's even research if we paralyze with botox the frowning muscles sure enough depression gets better wow we block <laughs> the ability to frown so the or body is really telling the mind how to feel in some ways it's a two-way loop mm -hmm. so definitely 100 percent well dave our culture is very, let's fix what's broken, let's name a disease and address it, but we're not as proactive about having, let's say, a health plan. So when you want to prescribe a lifestyle to people, how do you recommend that we go about shifting our mindsets to not just getting by or preventing disease, but actually being our best selves? What I want and hope is that that's a lifelong mission and commitment. Mm -hmm. um, I think without growth, life is really boring yeah. with anything. You know, if we don't, if we're stagnant, uh, things start to rot and decay. Yeah. So I think that's one of the purposes of life is continual growth. Yeah. And, um, and the journey kind of into well-being is one that's um, limitless mm -hmm. and that we can continue to grow into. In Western culture, there's a big deficiency in self-care yeah and I think sometimes people think of it as selfish uh -huh. um, and one of my teachers he uses the word enlightened self-interest because you know I know as a dad when I take care of myself and my cup's full and overflowing yeah the quality of my presence with my family is so much better mm -hmm. than if my cup is empty yeah and that's true with my patients so I kind of see self-care as the primary mode of being of service in the world and then yeah. when my cup overflows i share it with my committed relationships yeah. and if there's more then it's with my work and then my community kind yeah. of growing out from there mm -hmm. it's a really good paradigm shift yeah you know my, my practice is called source md because uh -huh. i think primarily we are the source of our own well-being yeah so i see it as kind of a journey from the inside out uh-huh it's a great name Thank you, yeah. yeah. How are you cultivating joy in your life right now? Setting time and space for play, fun, adventure. Uh -huh. In my career, there's so many hours spent uh, learning mm -hmm. and time becomes such a precious resource that we can fall into this pattern of um, only doing, spending time on productive things. Uh -huh. And that can have a big impact on my own well-being right physical activity is a big part of that for me so surfing yoga running with my dog um time both with you know like date night with my wife uh -huh. but also time just with men uh -huh. um and community time so connection you know real having quality connection experiences with friends and community is an, another big part of that well, Dave, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be on this. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. That was Dr. Dave Larson of Source MD, and the link to Dave's website is in the description box right below this video, so be sure to check that out.
While you're there in the comments section, let me know of the lifestyle domains he talked about, which one do you have room for improvement in? Before you go, subscribe for a new video each week, and I look forward to seeing you soon for our next happiness adventure.